This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st Century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And welcome to this edition of A Different Perspective. I am, in fact, Kevin Randall. I had a rant planned for this afternoon, but I seem to have forgotten exactly what I wanted to say, other than I've been studying a case from the Project Blue Book files. And the problem with it, uh, they labeled the case as a hoax, but they got the date wrong. They've ignored witnesses. Uh, we found a bunch of different information that suggests it's an interesting case that deals with uh, car stallings and multiple witnesses and that sort of thing. I'll put a, um, a posting up to my blog on it, which now runs to over 3,500 words, I think. Uh, so it's been kind of an in-depth investigation into the uh, into the case, but it's kind of interesting to see how the Air Force gave the impression of doing an in-depth investigation, and most of the information they gathered was absolutely useless because they had the wrong date. But that's the, uh, I guess, a rant for a different time. I'm joined by um, <laughs> Earl Gray Anderson. I kept wanting to say Earl Dean Anderson for some reason. I do not know why. Um, he is MUFON State Director for Southern California, a star team member, and an executive member of MUFON's The Experiencer Research Team. Earl has hosted MUFON's Experiencer Workshop at the last two MUFON Symposiums, and will be hosting three different events at the 2024 MUFON Symposium in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. I've just been given a nice plug for the MUFON Symposium, uh, for those of you paying attention. He has appeared on multiple radio shows, podcasts, and TV shows, such as the Travel Channel's Storming Area 51 special. Maybe we should talk to him about that. I don't know. The season finale of Motor Trend Television's Motor Mythbusters, Cars vs. UFOs. I'm pretty sure the UFOs won. And will be a featured host on the new TV series, The Alien Disclosure Files, available on Amazon+. Plus. Or, oh, <laughs> I should joke and say, now I'm going to cancel <laughs> Amazon+. Plus. Uh, but I'm not. Uh, Earl was featured in three documentaries that were released this year that are available on Tubi, YouTube, and various other streaming services. It will be a featured speaker this year at Contact in the Desert, which is kind of why I contacted him here. He teaches a, an accredited course on ufology, UFOs, and other worlds at the Los Angeles Otis College of Art and Design. He is currently writing his first book, The Gray Files, which should be published in mid-2024, so we're getting close to that. Uh, Earl does uh, dotes on his three children, grandchildren, and lives happily in Los Angeles. I <laughs> find that surprising. Uh, with his wife, Lisa, and his cat. Not meaning that the, the children are surprising. It's the living happily in Los Angeles part. Um, so that's... Uh, what we have on Earl Gray Anderson. Earl Gray Anderson, welcome to a different perspective. Hey there, Kevin. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm I'm sorry about the editorial comments into your <laughs> introduction. I but hear I it all the one. time. Hey, we're a hot spot, though. You know, if you are a UFO researcher, you want to be in Los Angeles. We've got all this stuff going, you know, off the coast. Uh, lots of military bases. Vandenberg is here. And I think that because of that, you know, we get a lot of a lot of really good case reports that come in to us. I mean, from pilots to military, uh, boat captains, uh, you know, it's just this influx. Uh, I, I've got uh, a team of about uh, 13 people that uh, are working with me here, you know, to, uh, 13 different field investigators, and I keep them pretty busy. Uh, and there, there's, we, we can talk about cases. We, we, and we can talk about, uh, you, you, you wanted to know about the storming area 51. I more or less told them on TV. I said, don't do it. <laughs> well, we'll, 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 we'll chat about that a little later. I wanted to, uh, sure. actually run down California because of all the bad stuff we see on TV about it, but oh, man. I'll, I'll forego that, forego, forego <laughs> that, um, 
the reason I contacted you originally is because you're in this contact at the, in the desert. I wondered exactly what your uh, program was going to be about there and give them a bit of a plug as well, I suppose. Sure. Uh, I, I'm really honored to be speaking this year. I'll be speaking on June the 3rd, uh, two, 2 o'clock or 2.30 around there. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a uh, PowerPoint presentation called The Gray Files. It's kind of, it's a little bit like the book I'm going to be putting out. Uh, we'll, we'll, well, be the same the name, gray, actually. The Gray Files refers to the gray aliens? Well, I, I spell it G-R-E-Y, like my, my middle name. Uh, I, I was, you know, I, I'm a musician. I worked as a professional musician for many years. Uh, in Los Angeles, beating my head against the wall of the music industry uh, for 40 years or something like that. But, uh, you know, th there were, Earl Anderson was too, it was kind of a vanilla name and, and people would mix it up uh, with with a couple other people. In particular, uh, there was an R&B singer uh, who had a very similar name, I think Carl Anderson. Yeah, Carl Anderson. And they, they put my name on the marquee the night he was supposed to play. And then they did the same thing to him. They put my name. So, you know, I came out to play my little acoustic, you know, original set. And there's all these people expecting to hear uh, R&B jam. Uh, Carl was the, he, he was the, uh, he played Judas in Jesus Christ. He was kind of a soul singer. So I had, you know, and, and there were nice audience, you know, some of the people, you know, I sent, used to send flyers out. We're, we're, I mean, this is back in like early 1990. Well, dragging, dragging, us, dragging us back into UFOs, <laughs> uh, the book is called The Gray File. So uh, what- And it works. Because what, of the, the gray aliens. Well, I just, so I just figured it out. Quality. I just figured yeah. it out. I don't know why. I'm slow today. Uh, what's the <laughs> book about, rather than me guess? <laughs> Uh, the book, well, we could talk a little bit about my own history. I, I, I became, a, a, and I do call myself a ufologist. Uh, you know, some people say you click your feet together three times and you're a ufologist. But uh, I have uh, personally investigated over a thousand cases for MUFON at this point. Um, and uh, so, and, and, and since I teach a class in ufology at Otis College, I, I figure that's, you know, appropriate. But, uh, it, you know, the, the way it started was, was that my mom kind of gave me a disclosure number back when I was five years old. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's where it started for me. And, and it became this question mark that seemed to grow year by year as I was growing up because uh, my mom had worked for Howard Hughes. She was one of Hughes's secretaries. And this was back in the mid-50s. And at that point, he was a germaphobe. He was uh, kind of a manthrope. He didn't like people very much. He just wanted to keep his distance. And uh, I guess that he trusted my mom. He liked my mom. And so he kind of sent her out to his bidding. Uh, she had to have pretty high security clearances because she was, you know, she was attending some very high powered meetings, you know, mostly military and, you know, uh, the Air Force guys. Uh, we, you were talking about Project Blue Book before, um, and uh, that, that was, of course, the Air Force's uh, so-called investigation. I, I think it was more, obviously, for the public. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, she said that back in the 50s, I, I was five years old, getting ready to go to school, and I guess that my mom noticed that I just had this deep love for outer space for some reason. I mean, my safe spot would be taking all the Time Life books and, and turning to pictures of Jupiter, turning to pictures of the early space program and stuff. And I'd make my little, you know, castle around myself where I'd play in there. And uh, I'm not sure why my mom told me this, but maybe it was just it was eating at her. She had, she'd left Hughes when she uh, gave birth to me in 1958. Uh, 1963, I'm getting ready to go to school. I sit down for my cornflakes, and mom is like, starts speaking to me like I'm another adult. She told me that, well, you know, son, that I worked for you. But my job entailed something very strange that people don't know about. And she proceeded to tell me this story about how they took her out with a security detail to the middle of the great American desert. She never delineated which desert. I, I, I kind of suppose maybe it was Area 51 going back to the Area 51 subject. 
uh, there, there is some indications that Hughes had the first privately owned uh, lab at Area 51. Uh, so, but she said that they took her to the middle of the desert. Uh, there was this concrete bunker out there, nothing else. And she said she wondered why they took her there. Were they going to show her a tractor or tools? She, they, they didn't give her any preamble to her visit. Uh, they opened this thing up, and the only thing that was in this shack, this concrete bunker, was an uh, elevator. And it didn't go up. <laughs> there was no second story to it. So she figured it out. She wasn't, you know, she was a smart woman. Uh, she had to be to have gotten that job. Uh, but anyway, she figured it'd go a floor or two down, and it kept going. And she said she started getting scared that she felt butterflies in her stomach. Um, she said that when the doors opened up, there was a little city under the desert. She said it was this bustling uh, city. That was the word that she used for it. It was like a city under the desert. She said uh, a lot of rocket scientists, a lot of secretive programs were being conducted there. Uh, that they got around in little golf carts, is what she said. Uh, she mentioned that they had uh, little cafes, that people stayed down there for a stretch when they would go down into this facility. Uh, she mentioned that they had a little cafe that had yellow umbrellas over the table, and she laughed, and she said it was funny to her because you don't need an umbrella in a cave. Uh, and... Uh, Anyhow, she told me about this, and then she sort of bookended this, this account that she gave me with, well, son, I know that you're so interested in outer space, and I just want you to know that we already know that we aren't alone, that life in outer space is a very real thing, that we already know this. So she Now had, it's time to go to school. <laughs> well, she had the opportunity to look at the, look at did, did she see anything, or was it just kind of what uh, people told her? You know, I really don't know. She, uh, you know, I would hear her talk about stuff when I was growing up. That was kind of the big reveal. And later on, she told me that she never would have said anything to me if she thought that I would have remembered it. But in fourth <laughs> grade, in fourth grade to her horror, uh, we had a show and tell day where we talked about, well, what do your parents do? And the kids weren't very interested in my father's landscaping uh, company. So I went and I said, but my mom, now let me tell you about my mom and what her old job was. And I gave like the fourth grade class, that was in Oaks, California. This would have been 1968, uh, pretty much the disclosure uh, speech that my mom had given to me. Well, let me uh, interrupt you there. <laughs> let, me, let me interrupt you there because I'm coming up against my hard break. So I've got to go away, but I'll tell you 1968, sure. I was flying helicopters in Vietnam. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so I, that was my experience in 1960. Not a good one. <laughs> yeah. when, um, when we come back, we'll explore a little bit more about Area 51. We'll talk about uh, contact in the desert and uh, your investigations into UFOs. And if you have some exciting ones, you can tell me about. Sure. I'll post more information to my blog, uh, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com in a few days. So uh, look for that, and we'll be back right after this. Welcome to Haunted Indian River County by Larry Lawson. Indian River County is an idyllic vacation spot on Florida's east coast, not far south of Cape Canaveral. Known as part of the state's famed Treasure Coast, many are unaware of the deep and fascinating history this area played in the development of the Sunshine State. Also lost among its visitors and residents are the chilling stories of the hauntings that accompany this rich history. It is here that a man named Waldo still looks after his family and properties, six decades after his death. Or a retired preacher is seen digging up his hidden treasure, days after he died. Larry Lawson spent more than 40 years in the law enforcement and criminal justice education profession. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Nova Southeastern University and a Master's degree in Public Administration from Troy State University. He serves on the board of directors of the Indian River County Historical Society, is the director of the Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation and is the owner of Indian River Hauntings, LLC.
where he provides historical and paranormal tours and events. He has been actively researching the history and paranormal legends of the Treasure Coast of Florida since 2010. Larry is currently the host of Paranormal Stakeout Radio TV show on the Exozone Broadcast Network and the past host of Encounters with the Other Side on WPSL Radio in Fort Pierce, Florida. Pre-order your copy of Haunted Indian River County by Larry Lawson on Amazon.com today. And I am back with Earl Gray Anderson. We were talking about his mother's experiences, I guess, at Area 51 and how he ratted her out to his fourth grade class. Yes, what I did. Any repercussions? Were there any repercussions from you telling that story other than her being horrified? Well, yeah, she uh, she was called in for a parent teacher conference because the kids started teasing me. They would do the little Martian antenna behind my head and. Uh, I guess that the teacher thought that it was disruptive. So she called my mom in and I was out there playing in the playground and I, I didn't think anything of it. I just, you know, parent teacher conferences happen. Well, my mom comes out of that and she's very quiet and we're walking to the car and I'm almost like, uh Oh, she didn't seem to be in a great mood. Uh, you know, I'm getting into the car and, and as soon as she's in the car, she starts talking and she said, son, I'm not angry at you. Now, then I knew I was in trouble. Uh, she said, you didn't know that what you were doing was wrong, but um, I need to tell you something. Um, I had to tell your teacher that you have a very, very good imagination because people don't know about little cities under the desert, and they certainly don't know about intelligent life in the universe. Uh, I signed stuff. I'm not supposed to talk about that, son. And she trying to drive and then she looks at me again and she says i could go to prison if you talk about it uh so she she was very upset uh i didn't talk about it for many years uh i i took her seriously uh, about that uh, i i've had a dod guy hint to me that he's read my mom's uh file you know i so my mom has a file he says of course of course your mom has a file she didn't lie to you i want you to know your mother didn't lie to you that you could be very, very proud of your mom. Do you know that your mom actually went and she told on herself that you, you went and gave a little lecture, didn't you, when you were a kid in front of your school class? <laughs> your mother was afraid that was going to get back to somebody, and she thought it was, you know, that she'd better tell them herself. And uh, your your mom was a very respectable woman. So well, uh, let me let me let me interrupt here because mm -hmm. the question spikes to my mind, and I, I think you've answered this already, but. While she was at this underground facility, which you suspect is Area 51. Yeah, um, it could have been White Sands. I, I've heard through other people's accounts a very similar story that was going on under, it was more well, of a computer. Uh, where, did, where did you live at the time? We lived here. Uh, at that point, I was living in Venice, California, about a mile okay, from the so, beach. So to get to Area 51 or to get to White Sands was quite the trip. Oh, yeah. So, well, she said she had somebody that could, they had a barber shop and she said there was a guy who could do my hair there. And that was when I, you know, when I got older, I thought about it. It's like, well, you know, you don't really need to have your hair done if you're going there for, for a day or something. So she must have spent some time under there. But she didn't, um, she, she, she didn't com communicate to you that she'd seen any alien spacecraft or any off world vehicles or anything like that. She was very careful. But what she did tell me was this. Uh, 1977. Uh, now my mom kept getting cancers, and I kind of I, I believe it was probably because she was irradiated somehow, because they were all unrelated, not metastases. Uh, and and the final time it, it took her life back in 1999. But uh, 1977, she went in for a uh, a cancer screening, and I went with her kind of as a support system. It was Memorial Day weekend, 1977, so. We're, we're very close to the date today, actually. Uh, but uh, she saw, I took her to see Star Wars. She got a clean bill of health that day. She was in a good mood, went out for lunch. And I was, I guess, uh, 19 years old at that time. 
we went to see this new movie called Star Wars that had just come out two days previous. Uh, I'd been, I read, you know, the Time magazine that was in the doctor's office while she was seeing her doctor, and there was this article on it. Uh, uh, the movie made an impression on her because when the curtains closed at the end, she started talking, just blah. She said, you know, son, Star Wars is not far-fetched. She said the different beings, the different spacecraft. She said all that stuff. She said it is really, truly like that out there. We already know this. And she went on. She was she she talked about this for a while. Uh, I don't believe she gave me any details like what the aliens looked like or any of that. But it was it sounded like she was repeating something that she knew uh, very, very well. Uh, it wasn't like she said I was told that. Just a matter of fact, and she said, "But they're never ever going to tell the public." She said, "They'll never tell the public ever, ever." And I asked her, "I said, why the hell not?" It's one of the three big questions in life: Is there a God? What happens when you die? And are we alone in the universe? And she she brought up the uh, Orson Welles uh, radio broadcast of "War of the World." She said uh, they're afraid people would react that. People were jumping out of windows, emptying their bank accounts. It could be harmful to world religions, to uh, fiscal matters. Uh, well, well, to know. be to be to be fair, to be fair, the world of world war of the world broadcast has become sort of a a myth. It wasn't that frightening by people. They people weren't killing yeah. themselves, and if no, it wasn't. One of the theories I have read is that it was uh, played up that way by the newspapers, which would wanted to force people to buy newspapers rather than listen to the radio and is <laughs> gathered this mythology about how I, everybody reacted. But that was like 1938. And now we're in yeah. much further down the road. I think we're more it was 55 between 58 is for sure. But, those but, years my mom was working there. But the point, the I point think that simply, that, well, the point simply is by, we are we are much more sophisticated now today than we were back then, and I don't think the panic would set in. I think we'd say, "Oh, I've, I've known this for years," type thing. So, I don't uh, think so but did did she yeah, exactly? But that was that was the and, reason. And I think it sounded like she she was repeating something that she was told. Is what it sounded like. It well, sounded obviously. like it was a litany that she was given. Yeah, because I've heard it from other people. The exact same, almost the same words. It's it's like the. Uh, you know, okay, you've heard this one. I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you, right? Yes. I've, I've heard that from a few. And, and, you know, we've heard, I mean, Barack Obama said that on television when they asked him about Area 51, talking about Area 51. Well, let's, and let's and go, I've let's had move. it repeated to me personally. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on a bit here. Sure. Uh, so um, briefly, uh, you mentioned the, the march on Area 51. Uh, and you said you were on television and podcasts and radios saying don't go. Would that be correct? Yeah, I, I've had a lot of people ask me about it. And, you know, I mean, the military, they, they don't take kindly to civilians, you know, incurring on their bases. So uh, I, I think that uh, if they had tried that, they probably would have met with a B-2 bomber or something. It, it, they wouldn't have... Uh, and that wouldn't have been treated uh, like some cute thing, uh, a, a happening, you know. But it was good, though, because, you know, I got to go and, and talk about this on television. I got to talk about, you know, properly investigating a UFO report and, and how you do things scientifically. Uh, and, but you, and, didn't, you uh, didn't go to Area 51 yourself. No. Now, I've been shooed away from Plant 42 in Palmdale. <laughs> they have camo guys there, too. I found out. <laughs> Even I was obeying all the signage, but I went there with an Italian film crew that they had sort of a nightline thing. And uh, first of all, they were disappointed that they weren't going to have like a Scooby-Doo situation where I was like a ghost hunter running after aliens with some, you know, tri-meter or something. Well, <laughs> but you say, the guy what, was shooed away. Where, you were gate. going where? You were going where? And why were you going Plant 42. there? Uh, and, Plant and 42. Because of UFO uh, activity in that area mm -hmm. or a belief in that? There is a lot of UFO activity there. And I've had uh, a lot of accounts of people seeing the black triangles, uh, whether it is the TR-3B that you hear about. 
have so many sightings of them that I really, and just the aerospace friends of mine, you know, and I have a lot of engineer friends, you know, uh, they can't tell you, but they can hint. And one guy talked a little bit more than he should have that, that uh, he knew which team was, you know, working on that. But uh, I, the rumor is that it's a, a joint project between Lockheed and that perhaps Boeing has a little, a little part in it as well. It's for the U.S. Navy. Uh, I've seen so many. It's almost like there's this, this flight path that I've noticed that goes from Edwards Air Force Base to Plant 42 to Point Wainimi, uh area here in, on, uh, in the Ventura County area. And what's interesting is, is all three of those places, they, they all, Skunk Works does have a, a facility at all three. So, But there's, you, real no, there's no real connection to UFOs there other than interesting The aircraft. black triangles are what people see. And, and, but they, they seem to be using uh, like the, the B-field uh, brown effect uh, to, to evade gravity. Uh, I do think that they're using a, a form of anti-gravity that they have. But I think that it may be in its infancy. They don't quite have everything. I think they've gotten better at it. Uh, it a lot of reports that I get now are kind of you sound more like Top Gun pilots doing hot shot stuff. I mean, I have one report where there was one over a music festival, the Coachella. And uh, there's a mathematician that was there with his wife. He was bored and he's looking above the stage. And, and people are just thinking it's a hologram or a part of the show, but it wasn't. It was not lit up. It was just a black triangle hanging over the stage, like this pilot just decided to hang out over the music festival. A but, lot but of the suggestion, uh, the suggestion is the suggestion this is Earth based technology as opposed I think to so. something off the world. I, I, I'd be kind of disappointed if, if we've had uh, you know crash materials as long as it's rumored that we've had them. Uh, you know, Battelle Institute and places, you know, I don't know if you know Dr. Irina Scott, but she was working yes. at Battelle at the time, you know, that apparently materials came in. And she, you know, she signed her NDA, so she can't say everything she knows, but she can hint a little bit. Uh, so I think that, that uh, you know, it's, it's like Colonel Corso's account, which is questionable. At, at, at oh, very no, least, no, Colonel, Colonel Corso's account is not questionable. <laughs> It's, it's it's blatantly filled with nonsense. Yeah, he 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 did. I think Bill Burns did had a little, little part in that though. But well, well, yes, that, yeah, that's that's the things, easy out for him. Well, Bill, Bill Burns did this, but Bell, Colonel Corso, yeah, Colonel Corso's background, as he related, isn't. Uh, as authentic as he wanted it to be. And the first lie you come to in his book is on the cover where it says Colonel. He was not a Colonel. He was a Lieutenant Colonel. And so from, from there, it goes back down, downhill. And as a former military officer, I understand how these things work. And when he talks about the relationship between him and the enlisted men on uh, Fort Riley in, in 1947 is not accurate. Um, the, Things many many of the accounts in his book are uh, not accurate is the best way to say. It. There's a picture that, that that has been out for years as faked, and he's got it as it, one of his uh, pictures in his book as being something authentic. And I think everybody in his uh, cousin knows that that it was faked. Look magazine did a uh, special on UFOs and outed that picture back in 1966. So we're well aware of that. So Colonel Coulson uh, uh, has always been kind was of it a the little uh, alien. That no, no, it's the it's the Ford Hubcap one is what what it is. Oh. Anyway, I'm coming up against my hard break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about some of your investigations, I think, and what what you've been doing on sure. the Star Team, and and really get a definition of what's going in the gray files for crying out loud. We will be back right after this with Earl Gray Anderson. So stick around. Are you ready for a tale that will leave you on the edge of your seat? Get ready to dive into the gripping memoir by Bart Sabrell titled Moon Man. Bart Sabrell takes you on a heart-pounding journey, unmasking the truth behind America's famous Apollo missions. 
Prepare yourself for hair-raising encounters with agents from the U.S. government's top secret agencies. In Moonman, Sabrell fearlessly reveals his real-life espionage adventures, shining a light on one of the CIA's best-kept secrets. Brace yourself for shocking revelations, including Sabrell's discovery of privately recorded audio exposing an Apollo astronaut's chilling plot, a plot orchestrated by the CIA. That's right, as Sabrell unveils this groundbreaking evidence, it becomes clear that there is much more to the Apollo missions than meets the eye. Could it be that we've been deceived all along? Moon Man is a gripping page-turner that challenges everything you thought you knew. It's a mind-bending journey into the unknown, where the line between truth and fiction becomes blurred. Don't miss this opportunity to uncover the secrets hidden for decades. Let your curiosity guide you as you join Bart Sibrell on his quest to find the truth. Moon Man, available now at Sibrell.com. That's S-I-B-R-E-L.com. Prepare to have your beliefs shaken to the very core. And we are back with Earl Gray Anderson. We are back. I am back. Uh, before we before we go on, um, Colonel Corso annoys me because he's a retired yeah. military officer. Yeah, and, he's gone now. So any, anyway, so and but, I think. But, but, the, but the problem is his book is being quoted as if it's filled with accurate information. And I think we who have been around the UFO community for a long time know it's filled with inaccuracies and half-truths and probably yes. blatant lies. He had said at one point, I was at a the festival in Roswell, which is coming up, by the way, on what is it, July 6th and 7th of this year. I shall be there for those of you who are interested. Um, but he said at that, at that festival that he had been the commander at White Sands. Mm. No, he'd never been a commander at White Sands because you can take a look at the uh, roster of the commanding officers. He never had enough rank. The lowest ranking officer Whoever commanded there was a full colonel, and uh, mostly it's been general officers. And the full colonel was there be at the very beginning, and one was uh, there for a while as an interim commander when the general had died of a heart attack, I believe it was. But, I mean, it was it's just filled with those sorts of things. He, he had been a battalion commander apparently at Fort Bliss, which is co-located more or less with White Sands, and there's a lot of missile activity going on between uh, Fort Bliss and the White Sands Missile Range and that sort of thing. But for me as a military officer, myself, a retired military officer, I, it just annoyed me uh, about what was in that book. And then to suggest that the mistakes were those of Bill Burns is just not fair. Mm -hmm. um, because Corso would have had a chance to review the final manuscript. Oh, yeah. And I like Bill, too. I, I mean, I've, I've met Bill and, and he's a, a, a very nice gentleman. I, I've been on but, the panel. Before, but so. he was more of a writer than a yes. UFO researcher yeah. and that sort of thing. So it was easy for him to be led astray. That's all I'm going to say about Colonel Corso at this time. Maybe sometime later, I'll do a whole entire program about all the things I found wrong in his book. But I will tell you one thing. Some of the things he said, I know as a military officer, just didn't, don't happen that way. Yeah. And you can take a look at all of these activities. And some of them are uh, what you would consider normal military activities. It, around the idea of a alien visitation and the normal activities are not right and they should be that sort of thing. Anyway, um, I was wanting to ask you about, well, let's go to contact in the desert first. Sure. Um, and, and you're going to be pre uh, as a president or a presentator. <laughs> well, just say a lecturer, presenter, I think presenter, Present. presentator. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you'll be doing what? What are your what are your presentations going to entail? Uh, I'm going to tell. I'll probably start pretty much with the story I just told you about my mom because that's the was my genesis. That's that's my origin story. I mean that put the big question mark and it, it just grew over the years. And I tried to get her to talk more. And sometimes I get like a little, but she went back into the to the aerospace field she worked as a like a headhunter for a corporate headhunter for all the major you know Northrop and everybody Lockheed uh, and uh, so she couldn't she really zipped up there towards the end on, on her deathbed she she did confirm the story she confirmed the story of working in the little city under the desert for a skeptic friend of mine uh, it, I don't know if she was having a good day or a bad day, but she 
you know, I, I, this guy was kind of saying, you know, I don't believe that and blah, blah, blah. And I said, here, come on. I took her out to my mom's room and she was, in, you know, her sick bed, sadly, but, you know, she was reading something. And I said, you know, hey, tell Ken about your, can you tell Ken about your old job at Hughes for me about the city? Just once for one person, please. And, you know, she pulls her glasses down on her nose and puts her book down and she told him. And, and he was questioning her, and she said, well, how do you think that we keep our national secrets safe? She said, you put them underground. You know, there's satellites, there's spies, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, we don't want uh, other foreign nationals to know. So well, let's, uh, let's, let's, divert, let's divert from there. In your lecture, are you going to be talking about any... Um, UFO investigations? You oh, can... yeah. I'll be talking about a lot of different cases that I've what's had. One of the, had. What's one of the most interesting that you've, you've investigated yourself? Well, let's see. I, I recently had a, a crew of a, a flight crew from a commercial airline. Uh, it was Hawaiian Airlines uh, come forward with a flying saucer sighting. It was uh, They were at the International Date Line. Uh, it was between Japan and Hawaii. And uh, I guess the closest place was California, so I, I got this case. Uh, it started because the same pilot had had another sighting recently. It was out near the Channel Island. It was what they call the racetrack UFO, spinning around in kind of an oval pattern. Uh, now, I've, you know, somebody from NASA was telling me that's actually ours, but I can't talk about it. But what he told me about his initial sighting was in 2005, I'm sure was not out, that they were past the international date line and that uh, there was, it was dark, see all the stars, and that there was just a little limb of blue around the, you know, the horizon line. When they see these three silver saucers, because each one had to be 200 feet across, but they went into a triangular folding pattern and just sat there like they wanted to be seen. Uh, he said that they sat there for a couple of seconds, and the whole flight crew was there. It was himself, the other pilot, and there was the uh, flight engineer. And the, he said instantaneously they shot down below the horizon. He said they were still technically in outer space. Uh, he mentioned how you could see certain shuttle maneuvers from that height. So, uh, I guess it was 39,000 feet, 36,000 feet around there. Uh, that they like when they did the tether e experiment with the at, you know the, the space shuttle that they could actually see the tether and, and all that going on. So he said that it was you know pretty much low Earth orbit where they saw it. I mean, NORAD must have gotten a hit <laughs> from it, you know. And uh, but this was a full flight crew. Now that this was a recent one that I had, I thought it was very uh, a very very good uh, good sighting. What did, uh, what did they say the UFOs looked like? What did they, did he describe the objects were, at all? He said that they were perfectly silver, like chromed, that there were no surface features, no windows that you could see, no external features except just these silver discs, uh, like you took two plates and put them on top of each other. Uh, and he said they had to have been 200 feet across each uh, since then, this this gentleman has gone public. He's he's he uh, recently retired from Hawaiian Airlines. He felt like his pension is safe because of the relaxed rules that they have uh, now. Uh, thank that MUFON is part of, by the way. That we we were talking with Congress and and I guess had a part in getting the the whistleblower rules kind of relaxed a bit more than they used to be. I mean, it was time where you would wind up flying a desk if you reported anything like that. Well, did he, did it, they uh, take photographs? Did he get any photographs? Was uh, anything on radar? Is there any confirmation, uh, other confirmation than the eyewitness testimony? It was eyewitness testimony. And, and most UFO reports are eyewitness testimony. I mean, I've got like one beautiful, uh, kind of a, a classic saucer with a cupola photo from uh, somebody in Britain that I know that's actually a still from a video. You watch the video, you have to go frame by frame. Uh, it starts out spindle shaped. It seems to shape shift into the classic uh, saucer with a cupola. You see something behind it that's like a black cloud and it goes 
further into that and the next frame is blank it's just blue skies so well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll cut in right here and say what <laughs> i have seen a wonderful video of what looks like a dome disc landing oh uh, i mean it's a perfect perfect uh, uh, film and it's fully credible and then it turns and you realize it's an f-117 oh <laughs> it was just the perspective of it so when people start talking about shape shifting i think maybe the perspective has has shifted as opposed maybe. to the size of the craft and i i bring that up simply because uh you you say well the saucer shape shifted and people suddenly tune out because they think well they can't do that and of course maybe they could based <laughs> on their technology i know but I it also figure. it also may be a matter matter of perspective and i yeah i, I agree with I that check that uh I'm well. not sure which it is. Uh, I, I, I figure that if we handed an iPhone to Galileo, uh, he, that he would he would think that it was just magic. I mean, it's Arthur Clarke's old uh, law uh, that that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And, you know, I, what we can do with holograms and, uh, you know, you, you show that to somebody 300 years ago and they'd burn you at the stake as a witch. So, well, the one, uh, the one I always use, the one I always <laughs> use, if, if you take a VCR, a video cassette recorder for you youngsters out there, <laughs> back to Merlin the Magician and you've got a power pack and a, and a monitor and a player and you show them this black ribbon and say duplicate it. And to do that, he has to understand two things that are invisible, or, yeah, invisible, electricity and magnetism. And he could not du duplicate it because the cultural elements wouldn't exist at that time yeah. to enable him to do that. So I, I, it's kind of the same analogy. I agree. I, I always say uh, my cell phone is better than communicators on Star Trek because I have access to the entire yeah. uh, knowledge of the human race through my cell phone. So, you know, it, it kind of works that way. They don't have uh, to call computer, you know, a computer. Yeah. We don't have to do that. It's the old Google machine. So no, we have to say Alexis. <laughs> Alexis, yeah. tell yeah. me about flying saucers. I did that purposely for all of you who are listening to that and, and your <laughs> Alexis. Is go off. And I'll be getting stuff about UFOs, I, I, I hope. Um, <laughs> do you have you've investigated abduction reports at all? Oh, yeah, that's kind of my specialty. I. Uh, and I'll say, I mean, this, I believe that this phenomenon is interactive. If you poke at it, it can poke back. Uh, I had a strange encounter that and I had never seen a UFO before in my life. I'd never had anything happen like this before. Uh, I was sober. I wasn't taking psychedelics or drinking or anything. I was working on case reports. This was about nine years ago. And uh, I had, a, it, my wife was asleep. Uh, in front of the bed, it started swirling, and it was sort of a sepia color. The room was filling with this bluish light. It did not have a source. And uh, I met the little gray guys, and I was scared to death. Uh, I asked for it. I mean, I literally, I, I was very naive uh, when I first came into uh, into this field, uh, and I just I decided to try the CE5 meditation, but it wasn't good enough to just see a little light in the sky or, you know, military flares possibly. So I sent out, you know, I just more or less said, uh, you can abduct me if you want, if that's the price of the ticket, because I want to meet you. Come and take my DNA, you know. And apparently they took me up on it. Now, I know that sounds pretty crazy and far-fetched. And believe me, I drove like four hours to talk to my state director at the time. And he, he didn't want to hear about it. Uh, he told me that uh, you need to keep this story to yourself because people are going to think you're nuts. Uh, and I did. I did keep it to myself. But my wife went through something two nights later, same kind of thing. And, you know, she didn't believe me the first night. And then two nights later, she's the one that's pacing back and forth by the bed, shaking me awake and going, you need to tell your little friends to leave us there alone. You know, I didn't well, sign me, up me, for this. You know. Let me break in because, again, I'm up against a hard break. When we come oh, back, sure. we'll continue that story. And I'll ask you about the uh, Pascagoula abduction, which is. The oh, yeah. My, Calvin was a friend. My, my book, uh, 1973, which is now out available on Amazon. We will be back right after this. By the way, the blog is kevinrandall.blogspot.com, and there will be additional information up there, so you can take a look at that. And we will be back right after this. Oh 
Are you interested in evolving with the times and becoming all you can be? Don't you wish there was one place to find the latest information to help guide you through the process? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio TV. Join me on my mission to find the latest evolutionary knowledge and tools. The guests on Mission Evolution are leading experts in a wide variety of divergent topics, including allopathic, holistic, and integrative medicine, epigenetics, enlightenment, quantum physics, meditative practices, environmental issues, spiritual evolution, trauma healing, and so much more. Mission Evolution Radio TV is aired worldwide through the Exxon Broadcast Network, Exxon TV Channel 32 on Simul TV. You can enjoy our archives of radio or TV shows with our compliments at www.missionevolution.org. Come see the amazing lineup of guests and topics. With more than 200 episodes to choose from, you're sure to find what you're looking for. Visit www.missionevolution.org. I am joined by Earl Gray Anderson, as you can plainly see. I have this propensity to want to call him Earl Dean Anderson, and I don't know. (laughs) I think it was Gary Dean Anderson. Was was yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think it really is um, is is the guy from uh, Stargate SG One. Okay. Yeah. You know, I think that might be the problem there. Anyway, (laughs) I answered a multitude of things. Richard Dean Anderson is is his name, by the way. That was the guy, Richard. When we when we broke. When I rudely interrupted you, um, you were talking about uh, your wife's possible abduction, and did she was she abducted or she did she? It just was a visit for me. Visit. I don't know if she, it was different from her. She doesn't have any remembrance of it except for the the shaking me part, and and it seems like her memory was scrubbed. But two nights later, our house was uh, lit up from above by what seemed like a laser cannon. <laughs> Uh, you know, again, our room, you know, the way it started, it was sort of the classic Oz effect. Uh, sounds became muffled, uh, bluish light with no source. Time seemed strange and, and you seem to be put into sort of a hypnagogic state. Uh, third night, uh, it was just sort of the blueish light that was in our room. And then nothing was there that could have lit it up. Uh And uh, we both, but there was also light coming from the Venetian blinds that were on the side of our house. And we pulled them up and by God, the whole backyard was lit up by, it it was so bright that it looked like, I mean, it was so delineated. Every little leaf was casting almost its perfect silhouette in black. Uh, And and, and you could, uh, you know, and there was no sound of a police rotor you know you're 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 you're, as a field investigator you got to check off everything that that could possibly be that would be prosaic and but there was there was just no i mean the only the only prosaic answer i think of is is what do we have like lasers and low earth orbit that can do this uh but it it was very very strange and it seemed almost like this tag at the very end or this signature or something so well, I, suppose too much, I suppose it's too much to hope you had security cameras. And, you know, people don't get stuff on cameras. I mean, our, I don't think that our visitors really want, I don't know that they even want disclosure. I mean, they could land on the White House lawn if they wanted to, but it all seems to be done surreptitiously and secretly. And, and they don't tend to leave when you have a contact episode. Uh, th- this is a conversation at MUFON, you know, as they want people to try to get evidence and, it's hard to explain that usually there isn't with these. Sometimes there is. Sometimes you'll have marks left on the person. Uh, we had one case where the woman appeared to have had some kind of surgery done on her, which um, sealed her appendix, which was about to, to explode. And, uh, you know, she had the, a, a story as, as crazy sounding as mine, but she went to her doctor and he asked her, uh, when did you have surgery done? And she had never had surgery. 
and and this was a young you know a naval corpsman and, and she and her friend had uh, been they've been honorably discharged and they took a cross country trip uh they were stopped while driving in uh they were driving from san diego to utah they had uh, relatives in utah I believe it was in Colorado where they had to stop because the road was filled with something that doesn't exist, three foot tall jackrabbits, and they were all turned away from them. They had to stop the car or they're going to run over these things. They stop the car. They're trying to figure out what's going on. They get out of the car and it's, it's that spotlight that I was just talking about. Same thing. Uh, the rabbits turn around and they're no longer rabbits. It was a screen image. Uh, they're the little gray characters, which I think are maybe biological robots. If you can get a robot to do, you know, your dirty work, you don't have to expose yourself to pathogens and, you know, who knows who's controlling these things. I, I don't know that we've ever met the actual entities, to tell you the truth. Uh, I know if I would, I was interacting with another world, I would probably send emissaries that were AI or something. And maybe that's what we're dealing with. Uh, but for them, there was this missing time. And then this woman had this evidence of, of uh, surgery that was done on her with no scar and no, no record of having had an appendectomy done. And it looked like it was sealed by some kind of a laser cauterization uh, method. So sometimes you'll get uh, you'll you'll get evidence in that sort of form. Did she? Did she? Uh, did was she able to uh, describe what happened with this surgery, or did she describe the entities or anything like that? She, they were the little gray guys, and she has been hypnotically regressed. But this was everything that she remembered before the regression, is what I've told you so far. Mm -hmm. Uh, the regression didn't give her a whole lot more information, and, and I think that they can kind of block a person's memory. For instance, my wife, you know, I mean, it was a very dramatic moment. And we we shared a joke, you know, looking out at the back, you know, the, the, the backyard of our house with this spotlight. And, you know, a lot of that has been scrubbed from her memory. Uh, well, let's, let's, I let's, can remember, though. let's move on from there, uh, because mm -hmm. I mentioned Pascagoula, and you were excited <laughs> about that. And it, yes. And it's Calvin, a good way, yeah. because I uh, was inspired by uh, my interviews with Calvin Parker to write a book called 1973, which looks at the mm. entirety of the year and what was going on in that year with a lot of abductions, a lot of landings, a lot of sightings and that sort of thing. Uh, did you have an opportunity to speak with Calvin Parker at all? Quite a few times. Uh, I actually had him speak to my MUFON group. It was during the early, early portion of the pandemic, and he we, he did a Zoom, uh, a Zoom, you know, presentation for for my little group here. And I, I I always kept in touch with him. We were we were friends on the you know social media friends first, but we became phone friends and you know Skype friends. You know how you do nowadays. <laughs> so it didn't matter that he was out you know Pascagoula and I was here in L.A. But what a sweet guy! And I'm so sorry that we lost him. And he he knew that he was gonna probably not be with us much longer. And he kind of kept it to himself. He was very kind of a proud guy and such a sweet, dear person. Great sense of humor. <laughs> He'd wanted, you know, fishing jokes. He had a million of them, you know. Well, when I, I the, the one thing that I, caught my attention in talking to him, uh, and, and this is the one case where I think uh, you want to argue about the reality of alien abduction, this is the one case to argue uh, because of multiple witnesses, both uh, he and, and Hickson being abducted, but witnesses around who had seen something. And the Air Force investigation that took place the next day, uh, naming witnesses who had seen the uh, the craft uh, from a nearby bridge and things like that. So there's a, not like your typical abduction where, well, it's just the one witness or the two witnesses telling the story, uh, Barney and Betty Hill, for example. Yeah. But there are the other time, witnesses. There wasn't the all that evidence, though. At the time, it was, it, was, it was not, you know. What impressed me most about this was there's a document dated October 12, 1973. It's the day after the abduction uh, created at Keesler Air Force Base. And you've got several high-ranking officers in the intelligence field also uh, who conducted the interrogation, the investigation, 
And in it, that document, it mentions four people who had seen the abduction. This is before there was a lot of publicity on it or anything like that. Uh, and so that, yeah. that is a powerful piece of evidence to my mind. And also the, the tape that was made in the sheriff's office. One thing they did, I, I know you know this, I'm kind of explaining it for the, for the others who don't. Um, they went to the sheriff's office and they were left alone in a room and they didn't realize there was a recorder running. And they were just talking about what was going on, but it wasn't this kind of, well, we sure put one over on them. It was a discussion of what had just happened to them. So I think that's a very powerful piece of evidence as well. So if there's an abduction phenomenon and you want to point to a case that is not riddled with all kinds of problems, and there are many, many cases in, in the book 1973, there's a number of abduction cases that I report on that are very problematic. And I think probably a couple of them are hoaxes, but I, because it was in the context of 1973, I think we needed to talk about that. But it's um, a very, very, uh, a very, very important important abduction and, and, and it's a very um, well-documented abduction, I guess is what I'm, I'm trying to say here. So you know, I was kind yes. of, and, and you, you've got My to talk. My friend and colleague, uh, Irina Scott. Yes. Irina Scott has written, I think, three different books on, on Pascagoula so far, and she's, she's a dear friend. Uh, and, and she's also uh, is, has been a colleague in, in MUFON's uh, ERT, the Experience or Resource Team. So she's she's been mostly as a consultant, but she uh, well wonderful person. I, I was in Ohio recently, sadly for my father-in-law's funeral, so I couldn't take any time to go see her. But I was maybe thirteen miles away from her farm, and I, I was calling her up a few times. Well, there, let's you know, I, 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 let, let me let me say you you mentioned friend. you mentioned she's a wonderful fact, researcher. She, she works she worked with uh, Philip Mantle at Flying Disc Press. To, to create those books. So uh, that's kind of where we are. We're going to have to uh, break it off here because I'm running out of time. When um, you're going to be at Contact in the Desert, and when is that exactly and where? June 3rd. Uh, that's in Indian Wells uh, near Palm Springs in Southern California. Uh, I'll be speaking at the MUFON Symposium at uh, in Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth. That That's in uh, the second week of July, I believe. Uh, and uh, uh, oh, what else can I tell you? If you want to, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, I'll dox myself, Earl Gray Anderson at Gmail. I, I will answer your emails, uh, or you can go to socalmufon.com. That's our website, S O C A L M U F O N, and you can see the fabulous speakers that we present here. We recently had Steve Bassett was our last speaker. Uh, and, and, and I believe we have Joel Hynek is going to be speaking his very first UFO lecture, uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek's son, Joel. Paul yes, is well, already speaking to our group. Just, just <laughs> last week, I had, <laughs> That'll I had, be Paul, next month. I had Paul Hynek on the show. Uh, in a word or two, the Gray Files, does this deal with UFOs at all? I mean, we kind of danced around that and we talked a little bit about oh, your mother's yeah, experience. the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Just wanted oh, yeah, to clarify the whole thing that. Is my case files. Okay. <laughs> I know what we're doing. We'll hey. talk about the better cases that I've closed and, and my personal experiences. I, I will talk about my own experience. I do talk about it now. I think it's helpful. I used to just tell my field investigators as a little caveat, but uh, that will be in, in, in that book as well as a CE2. Uh, I had a CE2 sighting and I believe that I was targeted for both. That okay. uh, it happened well, for listen. a reason. So. Don't mean to cut you off, but I got to go. Thank you so much for taking time. It was a joy to talk to you. Had a lot of fun. Um, let me see here. I mentioned the book 1973, which is out, and it deals with the UFO sightings, not just the Parker Hickson abduction, which is a, a major part of the book in my conversations with uh, Calvin Parker and a little bit of the conversations. I, I met Charles Hickson, I think, one time a number of years ago. Uh, so you can take a look at that and get an idea of what was going on in 1973 and get a better perspective on um, the Pascagoula abduction. And I think this is an important case. If there's if there's alien abduction, this is the one that uh, I think is going to kind of cement that idea. Uh, also, um, I think you should take a look at Roswell in the 21st century because that does bring a different perspective to the case of, as well as does understanding Roswell. And as I've said repeatedly, my blog is at uh, kevinrandall.blogspot.com. I'm about to post something that deals with an interesting sighting. I mentioned a little bit at the beginning of the program 
that is labeled in the Project Blue Book files as March 29th, 1952. It was really March um, 15th, 1952. Multiple witnesses, car stalling and things like that and a bungled investigation. I will be back soon with another edition of A Different Perspective. So thanks for tuning in.